Hey there, thanks for tuning in to New Life Church. We hope that this message helps you grow in your walk with God. Before the message begins, please like, share, and subscribe to NLC Lancaster on Facebook and YouTube to stay up to date on all of our sermons. If you'd like to invest in the ministry, please visit newlifelancaster.org forward slash give. Thank you again for tuning in and know that God loves you and so do we. But I'm grateful to be here. I want to take you back to a powerful, wonderful passage of scripture in the Old Testament. We want to look at the book of Judges, one that we don't look at too very, very often. Although tradition ascribes the writing of the book of Judges to a man named Samuel, the reality is that we don't have with great certainty an awareness of the authorship of this book. The dates of the composition of this book or the assumed date of the composition of this book suggest to us from the internal evidence that it was written somewhere around the early days of the monarchy that was experienced by the nation of Israel. One of the things that it, it tips us off a little bit was when the word says time and again, in those days Israel had no king. The book of Judges depicts the life of the nation of Israel. And it depicts it, for, it depicts it for a significant period of time as they were moving into the promised land. The book of Judges moves us from the death of Joshua to the rise again of the monarchy so the time would come when Israel could not say that they had no king. On the one hand, we look at the book of Judges, it was an account of the frequent apostasy or the frequent backsliding of the nation of Israel. Israel had this proclivity toward getting it very, very right or getting it very, very wrong. And many times that was in the shadow of whomever the person was in leadership, the one guiding the nation. So went the leader, so went the nation was the story of Israel over and over again. And in those times of apostasy, in those times of backsliding, their actions and their condition provoked divine judgment. And that's one of the things that we see as we look at the book of Judges this morning. Now, on the other hand, certainly the book of Judges points out those times when God had to judge the unrighteous acts of his people. But on the other hand, it also tells of the urgent appeals to God made by his people in times of crisis. Moving the hand of the Lord then to raise up leaders, leaders who were eventually called judges. And God would in turn use these judges to dispel foreign oppressors and use them to restore peace to a land that, again, in part because of their own conduct, was filled with anything but the peace of the Lord. In Canaan, in Israel, one of the challenges that came was that the Jews very quickly began to forget the acts of God. The mighty, mighty acts of God that had happened in their presence and Lest we're too hard on them, let's recognize that momentary forgetfulness, it seems, is part of the human condition. Many, many times God will do things for us, amazing things, and if we don't really give great focus to it and take the time to really celebrate as we should, many times, just in the passage of time and the activities that come, those memories get a little bit dull and we start to forget the details of what God has done for us. That was the way it was with the nation of Israel at this particular time. They had forgotten very quickly the acts of God from giving them birth to establishing them in a land that had previously not been their own. Consequently, because of their behavior, they lost sight of their unique identity as the people of God. And many times in the company of those who know God best and serve God well, when we become forgetful, when we set aside an embracing of the acts of God that he has brought into our lives and our circumstances, many times we lose sight of the marvelous uniqueness of being identified as the people of God. The nation of Israel, because of these things, settled down. They settled down and they attached themselves to the Canaanite people. But not just attaching themselves by way of fellowship and developing friendships, the Bible makes it clear they began to attach themselves to Canaanite morals, to Canaanite gods, to Canaanite religious practices. 
and the Canaanite idolatrous behavior. It's fair to say that throughout the book of Judges, one of the fundamental issues that is addressed is the lordship of God among his own people. A lordship that was celebrated when they were walking right. A lordship that was celebrated when they were paying attention to and thanking God for the abundance of his goodness. But a lordship that was often overlooked in times when their minds and their appetites and their attention were captivated by things, many of which were decidedly ungodly. That having been said, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 6. And I want to read to you a significant part of this passage because I want us to talk about a very specific individual that we might deem a hero. We certainly deem a man of faith and one from whom we can learn a great deal. We're talking about Gideon this morning. Judges chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared themselves, shel prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on their land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so Im impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent, them, he sent to them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all the oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you did not listen to me. The angel of the Lord came to me and sat down under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abiazrite, the Abiazrite whose son was Gideon. He was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, to Gideon he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel from the Midian hands. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon said, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring you my offering and set it before you. The Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in the basket and his broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place it on this rock, and pour out the broth. Gideon did so. When the tip of the staff, uh, with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. 
When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and he called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abiah's right. Question this morning, the topic of this message is very simply a question, and the question is, where is Gideon? Sometimes when we look at cases like this, people rush to use the word hero. So let's define it this morning. A hero is a person who is admired or idealized because of their courage, because of their outstanding achievements, or sometimes because of the nobility of their character and their qualities. If that definition is accurate, if that de definition is true, then it's not far-fetched to refer to Gideon as certainly a hero. And if so, he stands then in good company because the scripture makes it clear that there are many of those whom we might call hero throughout the pages of the scripture. People like Samuel and Elisha and Esther and Barnabas, people like Abraham and Mary and Paul. But we discuss Gideon this morning not from the aspect of him being a hero and all of his accomplishments that seem to transcend both, both his wildest dreams and even ours. We talk about Gideon this morning because he was a man in many ways like us. And I don't think most of us would deem ourselves to be heroes who was much like us with concerns and creativity, much like ours. He was much like us in that he was a man facing the critical issues of his own day. He was a man who, had to, who was confronted with identifying exactly where he fit in and exactly how he would be used by God. What, ways, what were the ways that God was going to uniquely use him? And for us, maybe for all of us, if we have never asked ourselves that question, we will at some point. God, where, I, where do I fit in? What is the way you want to use me? How do you want to use my voice or the talents or the skills that you have given? Gideon was not that different than ourselves. So this man that is often hailed as a hero was simply a guy who came before the Lord with a lot of questions about a supernatural assignment that had been given to him. When we look closely at Gideon, and the legacy of his life, we find that he was indeed a brother in faith whose testimony proves, his testimony proves, that in many ways, in all likelihood, this is a brother with whom we can relate. Although the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 32, says this, he said, I do not have time to tell about Gideon. Although the writer of Hebrews says that, may I suggest to you this morning that Gideon's name is one of the many that is couched in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that talks about this great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, this great cloud of those who have gone before us, who have shown us by their lifestyle and by their actions that walking with God is doable and we can do it in a way that honors Almighty God. Hero. Perhaps. Hero of the faith? Absolutely. When it comes to this man named Gideon. You know, with that in mind, let me tell you just a few things about Gideon. I was going to share with you five, but by now you know that the clock and I are sworn enemies. So I'm going to tell you one. And maybe we'll weave the other four things about the life of Gideon into some lessons we share in the coming weeks before or after the Christmas season. But I want to tell you one of the things about this man that makes him so incredibly relatable, that makes it so exciting when we take time to study Gideon. I had the privilege several years ago in 2010 of standing by, we won't cover when he had to weed out the army and whittle it down to 300 people, but I had the privilege of being at that body of water where they believe Gideon did that. And then sometime after on that trip and the subsequent trips had the opportunity of standing up on a, a high embankment 
and looking over what's called the Valley of Jezreel or the Valley of Megiddo and seeing where this very battle that took place when the word of the angel of the Lord came true and Gideon, being used by God, wiped out the entire Midianite army. We had a chance to see that and hope to see it again and we're excited about that. And somehow it made the account of Gideon all that more alive and all that more true and all that more special. And it made him that much more of a hero. But again this morning, I'm not talking about the hero aspect of Gideon. The main thing I want to help you understand this morning was that Gideon was an ordinary man. He was a very ordinary man before God did great and mighty things through him. Now one of the things that Gideon did not do is that he never wielded his ordinariness as an excuse. Well, God, I get afraid to speak in front of people. God, I, I stammer or I stutter. Or God, I'm not the son of a king. Or God, I'm not a prince of of any land, or God, you've never used me in supernatural works before, so God, I can't do this. I'm just a plain old guy. I'm just an ordinary guy. There was a song that was sung back in the 70s and 80s, I believe it was, and it was simply entitled Ordinary People. God chooses plain old ordinary people. May I propose to you that with all the great things that happened through the life of Gideon, Gideon started out as a plain old ordinary person. Nonetheless, we refer to him often as a hero. So let me help us to see kind of clearly where Gideon stands in that capacity. For those who are not devotees, there are very few people in this year or last year or the last few years who have not heard something about a group called the Avengers. The Avengers have been recognized uh, via Marvel Comics and the big screen as heroes who are almost invincible. As I talked to various people, I heard people debate over which was their favorite Avenger and which of the Avengers to which they, to which they could relate the most. Let me give you the answers that often came when people asked, who is your favorite Avenger? Certainly Iron Man was at the top of the list because Iron Man had deep pockets. Tony had deep pockets and whatever he needed to buy or invent, he was a technological genius and he would make these iron uniforms and he could do anything when he was in them. Iron Man was empowered by a nuclear reactor that had been implanted somewhere in his chest and because of all these things, Iron Man seemed almost invincible. Others thought that their greatest hero was Thor. Thor was a mythical god who, if you were to hand Thor a toolbox, Thor was borderline helpless. But if you took all the screwdrivers and pliers and nails and staple guns and just gave him a hammer, Thor, Thor was invincible. He could fly with the thing, he could kill armies. He could do anything because he had this great hammer. There were some who thought their greatest hero was Thor, and uh, not Thor, or the Hulk, and I often wonder why. Because the best way I can describe the Hulk to you is that he was just a brother who had issues. Hulk said, I'm mad all the time. So why this man would be held up as a hero by anyone is a mystery to me. And then there was certainly Captain America. Captain America, who was, just his name made him a hero to many in our country. He was a captain, he was military, and he was all about the U.S. He even wore the colors. So for many, Captain America was the hero, but Captain America was this never-aging scientific guinea pig who was the first person to drink the Hulk juice. So he was around then for decade after decade after decade, never becoming weak, never becoming aged, none of those things that we experience. Those people are often considered heroes. But there was another Avenger named Hawkeye. Hawkeye was a person, whenever I've asked people about their hero Avengers, no one said Hawkeye was their favorite Avenger. Hawkeye was a man who 
was probably among all Avengers the most relatable to us. He had no superpowers. He couldn't fly. He didn't even come from outer space. Hawkeye was simply fast and strong, and he was good with a bow and arrow. Hawkeye had no superpowers. Hawkeye started off pretty much as an ordinary guy, and most of us are ordinary people. Why do I mention something as goofy as this? Because there are true-to-life heroes, those who stand in courageous places and accomplish great and mighty things. None of them have on iron suits. None of them came from some planet outside there. None of them swing a mighty hammer, and none of them drink the green juice and explode into this huge green person. Most of the heroes that surround our lives are just ordinary people. They're very, very ordinary people upon whom the hand of the Lord has rested somehow to accomplish extraordinary things. Our own history is filled with people who on occasion are referred to as heroes or having accomplished great things, at least in their own field. Let me give you just two from our history. There's a man named George Washington Carver who somehow, when looking at a peanut, thought something could be done with that more than just roasting it and eating it. And from his inquiry and from his investigation, George Washington Carver produced 325 products, useful products, from observing a simple peanut. There's a man named Nick Walinda who, to me, I don't know that I consider him a hero. I'm, I'm hoping the brothers just got it all together. But the Walinda family was known for their high wire act. And I think that's great when you're in a circus or if he was to walk the spans of this building, what are we talking, 30 feet or so. But the Walindas had this passion for going where people don't just usually take a Sunday stroll. Things like across the Grand Canyon or from one high rise to another walking on a wire about that big. One of the most baffling things that I saw Nick Walinda do was just a few years ago when all by himself, he walked across the Niagara Falls on a very thin piece of whatever it was. The wind was blowing. This thing is bobbing up and down. There is no net below him. There's no boat to catch him. There's no backup plan. And there's no way to say, oops. 25 minutes later, Nick Walinda is on the opposite side of Niagara Falls, a feat that no man had ever done. Most have enough sense to not try it. But for some, they look at Nick Walenda as a hero because he had the courage to do these outstanding things. Scripture is filled with bona fide heroes. People like Amos. Amos, who was used wonderfully of God. But Amos' testimony starts off with him saying, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of the prophet, but God has called me. God reached out to this very ordinary man because he had purposes at that season. He had things he wanted to accomplish. So he wasn't looking for those who had titles and positions. He wasn't looking for those who were known in their community as superheroes. He looked for an ordinary guy whose own testimony says, I don't have an impressive pedigree, and I've never done this before, but the hand of Almighty God came upon me, and I heard the voice of the one who called me. David, in my opinion, was a hero. David, we know that he is the most outstanding king in the history of the nation of Israel, a kingdom that will have no end, a king that was acknowledged by God, one about whom God said, this man's heart is after me. But David didn't start off as a nobleman or a king. David didn't start off as a man of great wealth. David started off as a musician and as a shepherd working in the fields of his father. But when God looked for someone to accomplish great things, he passed by all of his other siblings, and he said, the boy who plays the harp, who takes care of the sheep in his father's field, that's the one I want. And David went from being a musician and a shepherd to being a hero not only in Israel, but a hero in history. 
When Israel once again, now let me bring it to Gideon. When Israel once again had backslidden and had turned away from God, God found an ordinary man doing what he knew to do. And God entrusted this man to do things that he had never, ever dreamed of. God will look at your life, and God will look at mine. And as he finds us doing the things that we know to do, you and I might be the very people that God will call upon to say, there's something extraordinary I want to accomplish, and you're the one through whom I will work. Let me segue for a moment. We're living in a time in history, we are living in a time in history like no one has ever seen. Great men and women of God will arise from the body of Christ and accomplish enormous things for God in the name of Jesus Christ. Your name may never be in a ledger. If Jesus tarries 20, 30 years, no one may find a statue to your glory. But in the midst of the darkness of what we're walking through now, there are people upon whom our God is placing his hand because God is not done. God is not crippled by COVID-19 or anything else that is happening in this country or around this world. And before the return of the Son of God, God will raise up men and women who are willing to be in our ordinariness, mouthpieces for Almighty God, that he will use us. Hear what I'm saying to you this morning. Simon Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God gives, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is not the rocks and the rubble and the trees that are going to give testimony to the greatness of God. It's not the clapping of the waves or the moving of the clouds. It's men and women that God will raise up. And I believe some of them are in the sound of my voice this morning, and I hope to God that I'm one of them. Men and women who God can count on to stem the tide of the evil that is surrounding us right now. And it's timely for us to hear about Gideon this morning because Gideon, our brother, was simply an ordinary man who looked for no credit, who took no credit. But when the time was right and God was looking for somebody, God found somebody busy doing the ordinary things they did. And God put his hand on him. And God didn't call him Gideon. God called him Mighty Warrior. I believe with everything in me that this is a season for the arising of many Gideons. May you and I find ourselves in that number. Consider a few facts about this ordinary man. I want to share with you four things about Gideon, and I'll do it very quickly. First of all, he was occupied or busy. He was busy with what he was able to do. He wasn't sitting around saying, well, I, I, I can't fulfill whatever this calling is, so there's nothing I can do. He got busy with what he was able to do. And God saw him as one who was occupied. The circumstances were bleak. We just read them a few moments ago. The nation of Israel had done evil again for seven years. They're captive by the Midianites. They were oppressed. Their property was stolen. Things were taken from them. They were in hiding. And they called upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says the angel sat down under an oak tree. And he saw this man threshing wheat. And he called him Mighty Warrior. When there was a job to do, the angel found someone who was already busy. There's an old expression, I have found it sometimes true, thank God not all the time. But there's an old expression, maybe it's risen to the level of being an adage. But it says very simply, if you've got something that needs to be done, find somebody who's already busy. That's the best person to help you get it done. Because those who are not busy, most of the time have chosen not to be busy, don't want to be busy, so what makes you think they're going to get done this next thing you want to have done? Now, I know that there are exceptions to that, but I have too often found that scenario to be true over the years. God had a task at hand. God's plan was to redeem Israel from the hand and the attacks of the Midianites. So what does God do when there was a job to be done? He found this guy who was already busy. He found the guy who was 
grinding wheat at a wine press, not even where they would normally do, but at a wine press. And the Bible says he was doing it so that Israel would have food because the Midianites had gobbled up and taken up everything they owned. <coughs> so there was one man who found himself busy in the midst of this oppressive time. And when God looked for somebody to get the next job done, he saw the guy grinding wheat and said, that's the person. Many, many times that's how God chooses those whom he will use. He finds those who are simply busy. They're already busy doing whatever it is that God has placed before them to do, whether it's labeled ministry or not. He was an occupied, busy man. Secondly, he was an honest man. He was honest about what he was unable to understand. He heard the voice of God, and the word says that at one point he realized, this is the angel of the Lord. But there are some things that Gideon did not understand. He says to God, why has all of this happened to us? I'm hearing about God, I'm being reminded of the call of God. But when I look around me, why has all of this happened to us? He said, where are all the wonders that our forefathers have told us about? Did not God gloriously deliver us from the hand of the Egyptians? And he's saying, well, look, we're being beaten up by the Midianites. Where is this? I don't understand. He says, how has God abandoned us at this time? Or has God abandoned us? Gideon, my friends, was not backslidden. Gideon was not rebellious. Gideon simply did not understand. We find nothing in this passage to suggest to us that these questions were coming out of heart of rebellion. He said, I simply don't understand. God, how can this be? You're God. We are appealing to you because our situation is desperate. How can this be? My friends, let me just say this. If you and I have never had a doubt, if you and I have never had a question, then you and I have never taken the time to carefully think. God doesn't tell you that when you get saved, your intellect has to disengage. And God does not tell us that when we get saved, all of a sudden we know every single thing about the mind of God. We are growing day by day by day. And there are times when we come before God and we have questions. God, help me understand. Many have raised questions in the last 10 days. God, help me understand. I thought things would go in a different direction. And that doesn't mean you're backslidden or our heart is hardened or gotten corrupted before God. We're simply being honest and saying, God, I don't understand. I'm not challenging you. I just don't understand. Who among us is so celestial that we can claim to always completely understand what God is doing, or that we can always completely understand God's allowances? Folks, that's where faith comes in. When we come to God, about whom we are continually learning, when we come to God and God points out to us a directive, it doesn't seem to make sense. Moses, I want you to take these tens of thousands of people and take them into the desert, take them out of slavery and oppression. That makes sense. Moses, I want you to go that way. Well, there happens to be a sea in front of us that way. There are mountains on either side and a bloodthirsty army behind us. God, I don't understand. I'm not saying you can't do this. What I'm saying, God, is that I don't understand. Everything around me seems like this can't happen. God, I'm coming before you asking you to help me simply understand. Life is filled with challenges. Challenges provoke questions. Questions need answers. So to whom is it best to go? Who else but the one who has all the answers. When he couldn't understand what God was directing him to do under the oak tree, he simply began to ask questions of the very one who sat with him under that oak tree. Don't we think the Apostle Paul had questions when he said, three times I prayed to the Lord, three times I went to him and I said, God, would you take this thorn in the flesh from me? 
And Paul probably expected God to say, go to sleep, son, tonight. When you wake up in the morning, it's gone. But instead of that, God simply said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And my strength is perfected in your weakness. Well, God, I don't quite understand that, but I'm going to trust you in it. That's when faith comes in. When God says things to us like he said to Paul, when God finds us standing as Moses did when it seemed we're boxed in from every side, that's when faith rests in the hands of the one that we know said it. The Bible says there was a point when Gideon realized this is the angel of God. And even though in the natural he couldn't understand, at that point somehow he knew that if God has said it, it can be done. Glory to God. Gideon, like Paul, asked the honest questions. And God the Father, like God the Son, gave the honest answers. Gideon was occupied or busy. Gideon was honest. Gideon, thirdly, was realistic. He was realistic about what he was unable to grasp or to fully comprehend. God, you've called me to do this. And you said, God, that you would defeat the Midianites together. So that suggests at once you're going to do this. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. God, I don't completely comprehend what you're sharing. And again, this wasn't the fist in the face challenge to God. He simply needed for this to somehow make sense. Gideon felt a keen lack of qualification. It reminds me of when Moses was out in the desert or in the wilderness and some went out to spy out the land and their report when they came back was, we're like grasshoppers, we're going to get squashed if, if we do this. God, I, I don't quite get it. I know what I'm looking at. I know the reality of what I'm seeing. We're not as big as those guys in Esco. We're not the ones who seem like conquerors. We're just people who've been out hanging out in the desert for the last several years. How can we see it? We come to Gideon, and he had a keen, keen sense of his lack of qualification. I'm not qualified to do this. I have no army to do this. I have no weapons to get this job done. My clan is the weakest among the tribes in Israel. Gideon was not challenging God. He was simply asking God, how? I know that with God all things are possible, but to this issue, to this assignment, can you please, sir, just tell me how? How will this be done? How can it possibly be that I'm the guy that you want to work in to get the task done? How can it be? Folks, when we ask the question, God, how can this happen? That is not always a denial. Sometimes it's simply a confrontation with reality. God, I'm looking at what's around. None of this seems to make sense. None of this seems to line up. I'm not challenging you. But I'm looking at what you surround me with. I'm looking at what you told me about. God, can you please tell me how? Folks, one of the things about faith, I believe, faith never, ever ignores or denies reality. It simply builds its floor on top of it. Faith never denies the difficult things that happen. Faith just says, but God can do this. Faith never says, hey, you know, I know that I can't play the piano. I know that I refuse to take the lessons my parents are going to give me years ago. But I can walk over to that piano, and I'm going to play a concerto, just because I believe I can. Faith doesn't deny reality. But if all of a sudden, God himself said, Bradley, sit on the piano bench. Faith submits itself, or, or reality submits itself, and it's going to be one of those things like the account of Andre Crouch, who as a little boy had someone lay hands upon him because they needed a church keyboardist. 
And as they laid hands on this little boy, he goes to the piano. And this is the same guy who wrote words like, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Faith never denies reality. It simply builds its floor on top of it to get done the job that God said he would do. Once again, Gideon was in good company. Wasn't it Moses who went to God when God called him? And Moses' retort was, I can't speak. I stutter. I can't talk in front of people. And tapped Esther. And Esther was invited to go before the king. She didn't say, I can't speak. She simply said, I cannot enter. When Elisha's servant caught, found themselves in being pursued by their enemies, and it seemed like they were going to meet with certain demise, the servant of Elisha said, my Lord, look, what shall we do? And I think of Joseph. Joseph must have said to himself, this is impossible. His fiance comes and says, I'm going to have a child. That caught him off guard, but that didn't reflect impossibility. In his mind, he probably thought she was just unfaithful. But what caught him off guard was when she said, this is God's child. Yep. And so God speaks to him himself. And all of a sudden, reality, it would say, a virgin can't give birth. Reality gave way to the activity of the almighty, supernatural, sovereign God. So in his walk of faith, Joseph simply built his floor on top of that and went on for the next 30-some years being a stepfather to God's kid. What a frightening proposition. I remember years ago when, I told you this before, so I'll leave out most of the details, when God called us to pioneer the first church we pastored. And I went from preaching every now and then as a staff pastor to, God, I'm going to have to preach two, three, sometimes four times a week. Folks, I used to get physically, violently physically sick. I would get so nervous before I preached. And I remember saying to God in 1983, God, you have to do something. Because if you don't, my exact words to God, I'm going to die. Because physically, I can't do this. I simply can't. The Lord's response was a question. What did I call you to do? I said to preach. And he said, as I've told you before, he said, then do it. That was it. He didn't deny, nor did I, the many, many times I got so nervous I would get violently ill. But faith was time to build our floor on top of that and do what God was calling us to get done. Gideon was a man who was realistic in the face of his trial. But thank God he didn't stop there with the pondering. He stopped with this one last thing that I will tell you, and I'll tell you very quickly. Yes, he was occupied and busy. Yes, he was honest. Yes, he was realistic. But he was also attuned. He was attuned and aware. He was attuned to the relentless decrees of Almighty God. A decree is simply an official order by somebody who's an authority to give it. He wasn't just captivated with the, surrounded, the surrounding armies and all that they were doing. He was attached to and he became aware of the relentless decrees of God. Maybe he rehearsed some of those that predated his own awareness or his own conversation under the tree. But certainly he rehearsed what the angels of the Lord said to him. And he was now keenly aware of what God was saying. Gideon quickly became aware that what he was seeing and observing around him was not the final word. When he looked out over the valley of Jezreel and he saw thousands and thousands of Midianites, he didn't deny that. He simply knew that was not the final word. And he just needed some reassurance. And the reassurance came from the word of the Lord. As the angel of God spoke directly to him, God said to him, I am with you. God said, I have a vision for you. Remember that God saw him. He didn't call him wheat thresher. 
Didn't even call him Gideon. He called him Mighty Warrior. The Bible says that God, not us, that God speaks of those things that are not as though they were. He wasn't a warrior. He wasn't fighting anybody. He's crushing grain. But God saw what he called him to be and what he called him to do. That became his reality. God said, I've already strengthened you. God said, I'm sending you. God said, I have victory in store for you. And after giving Gideon one more sign, found in verse 22, we find these words. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Folks, this was the turning point in the life of Gideon. It wasn't all that was around him, but he had some time with God. And he said, I've seen him. I've seen him. I've heard him. I don't understand all of it. And there was much more that God was going to say to him that would baffle him. Will your army down to 300? That would baffle anybody. But he said, I've heard him. I've seen that this is God. And I've heard that this is God. And that became the turning point. I close with this this morning. That was Gideon. That was in a time of crisis. God singled out an individual to be used by him to address the crisis at hand. My rhetorical question this morning is simply, where is Gideon today? Where is Gideon? Where is the man, where is the woman, where are the men, where are the women? Who are in the midst of a time of crisis, unprecedented crisis and questions. Where are those who are occupied with whatever it is we're doing? Rightly so. But those whose heart is so set on honoring God, that in the midst of the ordinariness of what we're doing, God can knock on our heart and say, I need you because I'm telling you you're a mighty warrior. I need you to be a conduit of my grace and of my presence and of my words and of my revelation and of my love. Where are the Gideons today? This is not a word of condemnation. Hopefully I'm provoking us to pray and to think because it just might be that this room is filled with Gideons this morning. People whom God will call might not be called to do what somebody else does or where they've done it, but people upon whom the hand of the Lord does and will rest. Where is that ordinary man or woman who's ready to do whatever God calls him or her to do? That ordinary man or woman who is occupied and busy doing what we're able to do. That ordinary man or woman who is honest enough to Recognize those things that we are at the moment unable to understand. Realistic enough about the things that we can't yet fully comprehend. I hear what you're saying, God. The plan is clear. How do we get it done? Men and women who are attuned or aware of the relentless decrees of Almighty God. God will continually, until Jesus comes back, Raise up men and women, ordinary men and women, to be used by him to do extraordinary things, all to his glory. We say that we believe it, and we quote Paul's words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here it is. If God could do it through Gideon, God can do it through us. It just may be that you and I are those ordinary people who God is raising up at this time. I plan to be one of them, not because I'm special, not because I'm looking for my name to be put anywhere. I just know God needs to find people who are going to make him known to others. And by his grace, I intend to be one of those. And I challenge you to go before God and simply tell God, I'm available, I'm ready. I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. I might not understand it, but I understand you. Here am I. 
Excuse me. Would you stand with me this morning? I want us to pray. Joe's going to close us in a chorus in just a moment. I look forward to the days when these COVID restrictions are but a memory. How delightful the memory will be, I'm not sure. But I miss altar call. This is one of those times when I would invite the saints to gather around the altar. We would shoot that clock. Just say, go home whenever you need to. I'm telling you that God is calling Gideon's this day, men and women of every age, to be used by him to do his bidding, to do his will. I simply ask you to put yourself in the place where if God wants to use you, he'll find you available to do the same. Amen. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful. So grateful, oh God, that when you look around this world, recognize the things you want to accomplish. God, it is very often that you look to just ordinary people who have a heart after you. And God, you begin to issue your assignments and through ordinary folk you do supernatural and wonderful things. God, you need mouthpieces in this day need people filled with boldness and with your spirit and with your word. Courageous people, O God, who might not be called to fight a military army, but might be called to go to that decidedly unwelcoming neighbor because it's time. Father, there are many, many ways in which you would use us. We simply tell you this morning, here we are. We're ready, we're available. God, we present ourselves to you. So God, if you're looking for a Gideon, don't pass us by. Find us faithful, ready to do it. God, for this we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.